everybody. This is Dr. Karens, and today I will be talking about Chapter 15, or Innate Immunity, for Microbiology for Non-Science Majors at Eastfield. And so this chapter um, and the next are both dealing with the immune system. You will learn both the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system in a lot more detail when you take Anatomy and Physiology 2. Some of you may have already taken it, and that's great. We're going to discuss it again here. The topic for this chapter is specifically innate immunity. And what I want to say before we even begin is in any immune response, whether you're talking about innate immunity or adaptive immunity, we are talking about your body's response to a foreign invader, or more specifically, an antigen, a foreign antigen. So an antigen is something on a bacterial cell. It could be on a virus or on a virally infected cell. Um, it could be on a fungus, something. It could be on a cancer cell even. It's something um, like a protein or a piece of a protein or something like that that your body recognizes as foreign and elicits an immune response against. So in the innate immune system, we are talking about your defense mechanisms like different cells, different tissues, different chemicals, different processes that will are present at birth. Everything we're going to talk about in this chapter, we have at birth. And all of these things will respond equally to any type of foreign antigen your body will encounter. It doesn't matter if, um, if it's a bacteria or a virus or something else, these innate immune responses will respond no matter what the foreign antigen is. And I bring that up now because when we talk about the adaptive immune system, that is a little bit different and more specific. So for the innate immune uh, responses, we kind of divide them up into two different lines of defense, the first and the second. The first line of defense are some physical barriers, some chemicals, and um, maybe some processes, mostly um, physical barriers and processes, namely your skin and your mucous membranes. And I'm not going to go into detail of the anatomy of those things because you get that and you'll learn that in AMP1. Um, but so refer back to that class and those topics if you need some more detail on the anatomy of these things. But in a nutshell, um, your skin, multiple layers of, ep of epithelial cells tightly bound together with tight cell junctions. Um, different cells that might be involved in actual immunity, so dendritic cells, part of the epidermis, they can actually serve as phagocytes. And then some different chemicals, uh, antimicrobial peptides, salt, we have salt on the surface of our skin. This is one of the reasons why we have staph all over our skin because staph really likes high salt, a high salt environment. Lysozyme is an enzyme that we'll talk a little bit in a minute. It can destroy bacteria. The oil or the sebum on your skin, one, it's helping to maintain the barrier of the skin we keep by keeping it um, from drying out too much so it won't tear as easily, but also it can lower your skin's pH, make it a little more acidic, and that can be um, uh, something that, that will kind of prevent some bacteria from from latching on and getting past. The mucous membranes are, um, are lining those, those openings and cavities that are open to the environment. So think of your respiratory system and your digestive system. Also lined with epithelial tissue, which again is a good defense in general because of the tight junctions and the thickness of that tissue. Um, but also you're gonna find Cilia in some of these parts. Cilia will be there to help catch things, especially in the respiratory system. Goblet cells that provide mucus that can help remove invaders and some chemicals as well. So in table 15.1, this is a nice um, 
summary of those those two different layers skin and the mucous membranes all part of this first line of defense also part of that i mentioned lysozyme earlier that has to do with our tears so the lacrimal apparatus is the um the collection of structures that help produce and excrete our tears and what one of the things we find in our tears is an enzyme called lysozyme and that has lots of antimicrobial properties which is a good idea and a good thing for us. Think about how many times you probably touch your eyes, even during this time when we're not su supposed to be touching our eyes. Um, and think about then how, or how rarely you actually do get sick. So we know it's doing its job. Um, part of this first line of defense will also involve um, your microbiome or the, that resident microbiota that is part of mostly your skin. Um, it's it's that when we have that staff all over our skin, it's gonna out compete anything new that tries to come in. Um, so not only is the skin itself and those mucous membranes themselves serving as that physical barrier, and not only are they providing other chemicals to help deter invaders, but the resident microbiota, the resident bacteria are also there um, in large numbers that's in a way that's going to make it difficult for anything new to cause a problem. Um, all right. Some other secretions that, um, they, that this chapter mentions as part of this first line of defense. So they list them in table 15.2. So things like even your saliva. There's enzymes, lysozyme is in your saliva as well. Um, even the movement of, of things through your GI tract, peristalsis, the fact that those things are moving, you're constantly eliminating pathogens that way before they can even be absorbed into your body. All right, so your second line of defense, these things that we're gonna discuss in a minute, they're gonna be important if a pathogen gets past those first lines of defense. So let's say you have a cut in your skin and, and some bacteria gets past that. There's still some defenses in place to prevent an establishment of that microbe in your blood. So we're really talking about things that are in your blood that are going to help try to, to isolate and get rid of them before they cause a problem. So there, there could, there's a number of different cells in the blood that are going to be involved in this, chemicals and processes. So one of the, the big groups of cells are your leukocytes or your white blood cells. This is also something you learn in more detail in, in, in anatomy and physiology. So I'm not going to go into detail over this. You can review this information if you need to. But keep in mind those white blood cells, those leukocytes, are really their key role is in immunity. Some of which are going to play a really important role in adaptive immunity. But others, are, you're going to see um, a few times when we talk about some of these processes and things in the innate immune response. The, the ones that um, we'll, we definitely will see again are those that are fall under this granulocyte category, meaning they have granules inside them. Those granules are made up of different inflammatory chemicals and in which inflammation, this is one of those processes we're going to talk about. We'll come back to that in a second. All right, so we've got white blood cells or leukocytes that are going to do various things, some of which we'll talk about. One of the processes that um, is going to take place in the blood as the second line of defense is phagocytosis. So we need phagocytes. Type It's a type of white blood cell. It's a type of of um, macrophage. Um, this is basically your body's way of finding usually a cell, maybe bacteria. It could be a um, an infected body cell by maybe bacteria or by virus or something like that. And that phagocyte is going to find it, engulf it, and get rid of it. And there's six stages to this process. So let's I'm going to look at the image while I talk about them. This is Figure 15.6 showing you phagocytosis. The first step is chemotaxis of the phagocyte to the microbe. So there's some kind of chemical that's signaling to that phagocyte that there's a microbe somewhere that we need to get rid of. 
And the chemical could be a variety of different things. Then there needs to be adhesion between the phagocyte and the invader. Let's say it's a bacteria. Then that phagocyte, which if you're looking at this image, is a lot larger than the invader, which is helpful when, when you're trying to engulf something. Um, that's step number three, ingestion of the microbe by the phagocyte. So engulfing, basically by endocytosis. And so that bacterial cell is now surrounded by a vesicle. We call it the phagosome. This vesicle needs to fuse with other vesicles in that phagocyte in order for that bacteria that's in that vesicle to be destroyed. That is step four. The other vesicles are probably lysosomes because those contain enzymes that are gonna dissolve and destroy those bacterial cells. And that is step five. The microbe is killed by enzymes and other chemicals that are found within these other, um, in lysosomes and other structures in the phagocyte. Then the phagocyte has to get rid of the remnants, what's left over after you destroy that cell through exocytosis. And then your body will eliminate it in various ways. So that's a, a big step. We have lots of macrophages kind of surveilling the blood, looking for things. So they're there in the event that some invader makes its way into the blood. Other cells can kill invaders without using phagocytosis. Eosinophils is a type of a leukocyte. Um, it's gonna attack parasites mostly. It can secrete toxins. Um, and weaken or kill those different parasites. Natural killer cells also will secrete toxins, um, usually of virally infected cells. Neutrophils, a type of leukocyte, will destroy microbes by, again, some type of chemical, things like that. So if you're, if you're a cell and your job is to kill invading cells, but you're not a phagocyte, usually it means you're gonna release some kind of toxin or some kind of chemical that's gonna kill that invading cell. Some chemical defenses that we find in the blood that help get rid of pathogens. Toll-like receptors. These are proteins produced by phagocytes. They can do a variety of things. They can help in the inflammatory process, they can trigger the adaptive immune response if that's necessary, and they can help trigger apoptosis, which is cell death of the invading cell or the infected cell. You do not have to know the different types of toll-like receptors. Uh, other chemicals, NOD or NOD proteins, these are proteins from the cytosol of different immune cells. They can trigger inflammation, they can trigger apoptosis and other things. Interferon, you may have heard of this term before. It is usually associated with viruses and it often can be used as a drug against or treatment against different viral infections. But these are proteins that are actually released by your host cells once they've been infected by a virus. And the idea is a release interferon and the interferon will help inhibit the spread of the viral infection. And if, that's, if, if, if that response isn't really fast enough to deal with the current viral infection, we've identified what some of these interferons are and we've, we've manipulated them and developed them into treatment, into drugs, and we can kind of beef up this response by administering interferon to the patient. Um, some other chemicals. Complement. Whenever you hear the word complement, think of a system of proteins. That's what complement is. It is a collection of many serum proteins that um, can do a variety of different things. They have to be activated and they're done so in a cascading like effect or like in a pathway. So one complement protein will get activated in some way and that will lead to the activation of another one and then another one and another one in a specific order. What are they doing? They can, the, the, the activation of these complement proteins can lead to things like inflammation and fever, 
which are also part of this innate response, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, in a few minutes. Um, they can do, I want to look ahead for a minute. They can actually um, form what's called a membrane attack complex and basically kind of help poke holes into the cell wall of an infected cell, um, maybe a bacterial cell, and that can um, help destroy the cell and lead to apoptosis. So as I go back a little bit, the book talks about three different ways that complement can be activated. I'm not gonna ask you to know these three different pathways, just understand that they're all, they're all involving like this stepwise um, method of activating one complement protein and then the next and then the next. Um, the idea is the three different pathways is to lead to activation of kind of the final complement protein in all of the pathways and that's what will do um, the job of either leading to inflammation or poking holes in cell membranes and things like that. Okay, so um, we talked about that first line of defense, skin and mucous membranes, and some of the chemicals and things that are in cells that you might find there that can help um, prevent invasion. Um, second lines of defense, we talked about some of those leukocytes, we talked about phagocytosis, which is a process, some chemicals. There are some other processes that are part of the second line of defense. Inflammation is a big one. So this is a nonspecific response to tissue damage. This is one of the reasons why this falls under the innate immune response, because the innate immune response as a whole is also a nonspecific response. But this is responding particularly to t tissue damage. And so the characterizations of inflammation, redness, heat, swelling or edema, and pain. And there's acute inflammation, which is something that develops quickly and then is short-lived. That is ideal. We want the inflammation to do what it needs to do to get rid of a possible infection, but then we want it to stop when it's done and after it's done its job because if it leads to or if it turns into chronic inflammation due to some other issues, that can cause tissue damage. So there are, there are some diseases out there, think of like arthritis. What is arthritis? It is chronic inflammation of your joints. Um, and inflammation means there's lots of chemicals around that area and it's everything that happens during inflammation, the longer it happens, the more um, damage it can uh, incur on your joints or on your tissues, wherever the inflammation is. So while inflammation is a good thing, it's a good thing in small doses. Um, so what's going on during inflammation? So the first thing is your blood vessels dilate and they become increasingly permeable. Why? So we call this vasodilation is the dilating part. We want the blood vessels, this is, this is going to be near the site of the tissue damage that this happens. We want those blood vessels to dilate because it allows for more immune responders to get to that area. Maybe we need some neutrophils there to get rid of any bacteria that might have entered into that tissue damage, whatnot. Because of that dilation and blood is now rushing to that area, the area becomes red. So that's where the redness comes from. And heat a little bit because blood brings heat. Um, and, uh, well, not so much swelling just yet. The dilation is definitely bringing the redness. Um, chemicals that can trigger and promote vasodilation, the vasodilation part of inflammation. Bradykinins, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, histamine. These are all things that you can find in your blood. Some of these are found in those granulocytes that I talked about, and those are the inflammatory chemicals that will get released. If you know histamine, think of like if you've got seasonal allergies, histamine is what's causing the itchy and watery eyes. 
Histamine is what causes your um, mosquito bites to be red and itch. Um, that's a side effect of, of that chemical, but the chemical is trying to do a job at the same time. So um, with that, and, and figure 15.12 is showing you those inflammatory chemicals getting released by um, those different granulocytes, those different leukocytes. How do they know to get released? Here we see complement again. So this is one way that complement can trigger inflammation. They can go and bind to these granulocytes and tell them release your inflammatory chemicals because we need inflammation to occur. So along with vasodilation, we get increased vascular permeability too. Because think about it, if you've got a cut in your skin, the blood vessels are beneath that cut, beneath where that cut is, but we need things that are in your blood to get to the area of injury. So they have to be able to leave the blood vessels to do that. The easiest way is to make those blood vessels more permeable. So those different uh, leukocytes can get through, different chemicals can get through and get to the site of tissue damage. But also what happens is any fluid that's in that blood will also leave those blood vessels and go to the site of tissue damage. And that's where we get edema or swelling. And that's what leads to pain because the swelling is pressing on your nerves in that area or those receptors, those pain receptors in that area. We also want, so, so this vasodilation and increased permeability of the, um, of the blood vessels is going to help this migration of phagocytes. We want neutrophils, we want monocytes to get to the site of infection so they can start doing their job and phagocytize any bacteria that might be um, there because they were able to enter through that cut. And then we want tissue repair. So yes, we, um, we want these chemicals and these cells to be able to get to the site of tissue damage and take care of any potential invader but we also need to repair the damage too. And so um, again, the, the um, vasodilation and increased vascular permeability is gonna allow nutrients and oxygen and other things to get to that site of damage so the tissue can be repaired. All right, and then the last um, uh, process as that's part of this second line of defense is fever. So any, any body temperature that's over 37 degrees, or for us in Fahrenheit, that's 98.6, or honestly, whatever your normal body temperature is, some people run a little high, some people run a little low, anything over what your normal body temperature is, is a fever. Um, what triggers it? Pyrogens. They'll, they'll go to your hypothalamus, which is where your thermostat is, and increase your body's core temperature. What are pyrogens? Anything, um, anything that could be released by an invader, so like a bacterial toxin could be a pyrogen. Um, things that get released by bacteria if the bacteria is destroyed. Um, antibodies and antigen complexes. We'll talk about antibodies in um, the adaptive immune response. Um, sometimes phagocytes that have done their job will release pyrogens too. Um, why is this beneficial? So a slightly higher um, body temperature, we know temperature can affect proteins, right? So it's particularly enzymes, those are proteins. Higher temperatures high, that are higher than what those proteins can withstand are gonna cause proteins to denature and unfold, including enzymes. And it will do that to a bacterial cells enzymes as well. So it helps um, kill the bacteria because it can't tolerate the temperature or maybe an infected body cell can't tolerate the temperature. Um, a slightly increased temperature also gets other things, just gets things moving faster too. And so it might actually um, uh, jumpstart or, or move along that the inflammation or move along the other innate responses and get them moving faster. Um, the problem, though, is 
the increased temperature is not specific for bacterial proteins or invading proteins. It will affect all proteins, including your own, your own enzymes that are involved in your metabolism. So this is why when you have a fever, you don't really feel very good. You feel really low energy, um, you just kind of blah. And that's because of the fever. But the fever is doing a good thing. So as long as the fever isn't at a dangerous level, it's actually a good idea to kind of hold out and try not to take anything to lower that fever because the fever is doing what you want it to do. All right, so that's pretty much it for the innate immune response. So um, table 15.6 is, is uh, summing everything up. It's talking about those, those um, things, those cells, those tissues, those chemicals that are part of that first line of defense. And then the second line of defense, which includes some processes and, and things like that. Um, so just a reminder, the components that are part of the innate and re immune response are responding nonspecifically to some type of foreign antigen, something on the surface of a bacteria, something on the surface of a virally infected cell, something like that. It doesn't matter what the bacteria is, it doesn't matter what the virus is, these processes and these cells and these chemicals will respond every time, no matter what. And I stress this here because the next chapter talks about the adaptive re immune response, and that is different. The end goal is the same. We need to get rid of the invader, but um, there's more specificity involved with the adaptive immune response and more learning or acquiring of the responses involved with that response. Whereas everything we talked about here is present at birth.